Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm missing my baseball. I don't even want to hear from you guys if you don't get your football in the fall. Oh my, the riots that'll hit the streets. I want to speak with you speak with you about a couple stories. One is a story, from, both are from scripture. One's a story of a, Jesus healing a man who had been born blind. But unlike other such stories in the New Testament, uh, where the healing is the main event, the healing has just a brief focus in this story, in this account. The bulk of this link, lengthy chapter of John chapter 9 um, in this story, the, the focus, the bulk of the story is on the characters in the healing. Uh, those who witness the healing, but fail to recognize God at work in their midst. For all sorts of reasons, they have trouble discerning what's really going on. And this is often our struggle as well. I mean, trying to understand what's going on now in our lives and in this world. One aspect of the John chapter 9 story is that the disciples in particular uh, engage the situation by trying to affix blame. So they ask Jesus, uh, who sinned? This man or his parents? Because someone had to sin. One of them had to sin for, for the fact that he was born blind. Jesus responds by refusing to engage the question as they asked it and he totally reframes the situation with this statement neither this man nor his parents sinned okay he was um, born blind so that the works of God might be revealed in him God did not cause his blindness or intend for this man to be born blind but God is using his blindness to reveal his power and his presence. And Jesus goes on to say, we must work the works of him, of God, who sent me while it's day. Because night's coming when no one can work. In other words, we got to work today while I'm with you guys. Okay, we have some good news and good work to do uh, to bring sight to the blind, literally and metaphorically, okay? So let's get to work is what Jesus is saying. And stop trying to play this blame game. So Jesus is essentially saying to them, you know, you guys have asked the wrong question about who to blame, about this man being blind. Now, why am I calling attention to this story in the midst of this global pandemic? Because at one level, the blame question is as unhelpful today as it was back then. You know, who are we to blame for all this? Like, that's really going to help us right now. We just need to help each other get through this. What's helpful in the gospel story is the way Jesus reframes the question. By reframing, Jesus helps us to get in touch with, how do I want to put it, the deepest cries of the human soul. Okay? Uh, and wants us to ask questions like, okay, God, what are you doing in all of this? What is being revealed? What does it say about your nature and about our human nature? How can we join you in ministry now where we find ourselves? You know, what are you saying, God? How can I hear you better? These are all questions we need to be asking that I think Jesus really wanted his disciples to ask 2,000 years ago. You know, what are the works of God waiting to be revealed in each of us during this pandemic that affects us so intimately and so personally, whether you want it to or not? I think if we knew the answer to that, we would know what to do on any given day. Even as we navigate the most significant crisis I think that many of us have seen in our life, we must not forget um, to ask this all-important question. What's happening right now? What's happening right now? 
And how can we join God in it? Because God is in the now. So how do we join God at this moment where we find ourselves? What is he calling us to do? You know, one of the truths that keep pressing in on us um, in so many different ways, I think, is one that um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, expressed in a letter from a Birmingham jail in Alabama. He said, I'm cognizant, cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. And I cannot sit oddly by in Atlanta and not be connected to what happens in Birmingham. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Those beautiful words. He says, whatever affects one directly affects us all indirectly. At this moment, it's the experience of the interrelatedness, interconnectedness, the interwovenness that I find so riveting because it's global. Right now, it's our interconnections and how we're navigating that reality that is a life and death issue, literally, impacting every aspect of our existence together on this planet. Right now, the inescapable network of mutuality, as Dr. King said, that has our attention. It should have our attention, that we're all in this together. It's being tied together in a single garment of destiny that um, I don't think we can, no, we can no longer deny, or we can try. We can try to pull back, but mm. the systemic nature of things, the fact that whatever affects one affects us all indirectly, is both obvious and beyond comprehension at the same time. Has there ever been a moment when we have experienced so profoundly the truth of what Dr. King was saying? I think not. So how do we steward this moment? How do we be good stewards of, of the time we have right now? I've been wondering if, if one of the works of God being revealed in this situation is that it will change forever how we understand and experience ourselves within the human community. I don't want to be overly dramatic, but I think it it can really impact how we see human community and, and interrelate. If we work it right, this experience of knowing that each and every decision we make or don't make about social distancing, about hoarding toilet paper, about overbuying groceries, about following federal and state mandates, about sheltering in place, and disinfecting our spaces and staying away from family and friends and loved ones when we want to be so close to follow all this will change us it just will we'll never be able to think of ourselves as being separate from one another that is my prayer even and especially across those lines that have so often divided us. Oh, this could break down the walls. If that could be a blessing in all of this. People are fighting though to keep the walls up, aren't they? I can't help wondering how this experiential knowing of our in interconnectedness might impact what God's able to do in and through us, both now and later. You know, one of the strangest moments the disciples had with Jesus was when he was 
uh, in conversation with them, telling them, uh, trying to talk to them about his impending death. And he said this, it's to your advantage that I go away. Uh, I don't think so, Jesus. I mean, at that moment, the disciples were sure that uh, they couldn't have imagined how that could possibly be true, that it would be to their advantage if Jesus just, Jesus just goes away. To them, the physical presence of Jesus right there with them had, had been their greatest good, but they would soon learn differently. For us Christians, one of the most confounding things about this pandemic is the need to practice social distancing. And, uh, and for a while, uh, for some of us, it's been an almost complete uh, withdrawal into our homes to refrain from gathering and hugging and passing the peace goes against everything we Christ followers know and practice. The cancellation of gathering groups where we can be physically and emotionally and spiritually present I mean, with one another, along with being prohibited from participating in our, our noble, our normal in-person connections with family and friends is excruciatingly painful and difficult. In part because I think it feels at some level unloving. And that's why this statement from Jesus to his disciples is oddly helpful and encouraging when he tells them that he's going to leave and it's going to be to their advantage. Because I think it points out that there are moments when it is loving to go away. And clearly, this moment that Jesus had with his disciples is, and clearly this moment we find ourselves in is as well. In our current situation to stay away is an expression of love and care for others as much as it is a protection for ourselves. Seeing this staying away as a loving endeavor and gesture might help you somehow. Henry Nowen comments, a theologian, he once commented, he said, in, about Jesus leaving the disciples, he said, in Jesus' absence, a new and more intimate presence became possible. A, a, a presence which nurtured and sustained and created the desire to want to see Jesus again. My guess is that once we make it through this crisis, we will think twice again about taking for granted the ability to gather together, the privilege of being together, body and soul. Our desire to be together again will be strong and sweet and will nurture something new among us. Oh, I pray for that. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to see what this new life is going to look like when we get back together. All in God's time. All in God's time. Amen.